Good evening. Welcome to a conversation with Stephen Harrigan and Al Reinert. This is a production of the Creative Writing Department, collaborating with the Radio, Television, and Film Department here at Austin Community College. My name is Sydney Brammer, and I'm an adjunct faculty in creative writing. I teach screenwriting and playwriting. And it's my really great pleasure tonight to introduce you all to Stephen Harrigan on my immediate right and Al Reinert on his right. Welcome to Austin Community Thanks, College. Sir. Nice uh, to be here. <laughs> earlier this evening, you all got to speak with some of our students, and we're going to recapitulate some of those questions, maybe broaden the conversation a little further. And uh, we'll start with maybe talking a little bit about the realities of working with the business people in show business. Oh, yes. I'm sure you've both had some wonderful, heartfelt experiences with that. So. Surprisingly enough, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, I find, you know, there's this idea of, of you know, producers and executives as, as people who are trying to ruin your movie <laughs> that, that sort of gets circulated by, by screenwriters, you know, all the time. But I found that, that generally the people I work with are extremely intelligent, very, very good editors, very, very, they have a very clear understanding of what a story is. And their heart's in the right place. And sometimes you have disagreements about how to get to, the, to your common goal, but I find uh, as long as you're open to, to the process, which is very collaborative, uh, then you can have a really good time and you can enjoy yourself and you don't have to be defensive or, or, or feel like you're being taken advantage of. It's just it's kind of a mental attitude, I think, as, as the writer. Am I going to play this game or am I not going to play the game? And, and once you make a decision that way, I think you really you really see the people as real human beings rather than as suits or whatever the, mm -hmm. the majority of, of the day is. You've worked a lot with HBO and, and uh, Hallmark, and that's a, a kind of a different world in some ways to uh, Hollywood producers, per se, or independent producers. Can you talk a little bit about the difference uh, of writing for television? Yeah, I've done a lot of movies for television for every network and, and cable company. And it's, it's, in some ways, it's a lot better because it's, it's the, the budgets are smaller, the, the uh, things are made more frequently because they're, they're less expensive and there's a greater demand for them. And so the writer has more leverage, mm -hmm. typically. It doesn't, doesn't get replaced as often <laughs> as you do on a feature. So it's really, uh, it's really fun to work in that field, which is a dwindling field. There are very few television movies or miniseries made today. But uh, the downside is the budgets are small. And so the, texturally, um, the movies don't look as, as great as a big, expensive feature. And there are certain restrictions. For instance, for if you're working for one of the networks and there are certain words they don't want you to say, there are certain situations they don't want the characters to be in. And again, I find that challenging. To me, it's like, I, I like being given barriers and borders sometimes, it's like writing a haiku. You know, you've got to write this CBS movie and there's got to be seven act breaks and each act break has to end in a certain kind of, uh, you know, point of decision for the characters. And that's kind of interesting. It's sort of a puzzle to figure out. So I've, I've enjoyed my uh, television writing experience. That's great. What about you, Al? I agree that, that most people's hearts are in the right place on a project. I mean, like, everybody is invested in it. Um, and you also have to bring a positive attitude towards it, you know? I mean, like, you are collaborating at some point. I mean, like, initially when it's just you, the writer, and your computer, you know, I mean, like, that's when you, you start to feel a sense of ownership that is going to get run over by a train, <laughs> you know? And, and oftentimes that can make the film better. You know, I mean, like, it, you know, you get the same ratio of good ideas to bad ideas that you get in life generally. And, and what you want to try to do is encourage the good ideas and, and, and discourage the bad ideas. And that can be a fun process. I mean, uh, it depends a lot on the, the p other people that you're working with, if they have that attitude too. I mean, like, you're always going to find you know, people who attach their egos to their ideas and you end up with ego problems. I mean, like, I've seen it more than I've been part of it myself, but I mean, but I've definitely seen it. 
And I've seen projects go really south, in my opinion, based on bad decisions by my bosses. I mean, like, I've been there a couple of times, and, 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 and it's not fun, you know? I mean, it, but I don't think it's special to the film industry, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. like, I think that's just part of life. The director relationship is uh, slightly different. It's a very creative uh, person who is taking your baby, so to speak. Uh, what have been some of the highlights of the, your director relationships? Where, what are some of the things you can say to us about what it's going to be like for people when they first have to work with a director who's going to take that script? Well, say I wish there was a rule to that too. I mean, like it depends entirely on the, the, the people involved. You know, sometimes it's a wonderful relationship, sometimes it's horrible. Sometimes there's really no relationship at all, you know? I mean, like, because you're actually selling your script to some executives who then go out and get a director who hopefully likes your script or they wouldn't be involved in the first place, but even that's not always true. Um, to where I don't think, you know, I mean, like, I've been involved in a half a dozen projects where I've had a director to work with, and they've all been different. I mean, well, I worked for a Japanese director that couldn't speak English. I mean, I, yeah, I'd, everything I'd write would have to get translated and sent to him, and he'd read it and translate, you know, I mean, write it in Japanese and get translated again and back to me to where we're both reading what translators are writing. <laughs> I mean, and that was a really awkward relationship, mm -hmm. but it was a movie. It was a great project to work on. You know, it turned into a really dreadful movie. <laughs> but, you know. <coughs> Can you tell us the name of that film, please? Uh, Final Fantasy is based on a video game, a Japanese video game, a famous and fabulous Japanese video game, and the creator of seven, it, it, that had gone through seven generations, there had been seven editions wow. of the movie, of the game, and it was the best-selling game in the world, and deserved to be, it was a terrific game, before they made the movie, and the guy who <coughs> had created the, the games was now the, the director of the movie and also the, the owner of the company. And it's a Japanese company. I mean, like where the boss knows everything and is infallible, making an American movie. And, and they hired, I mean, and they were the, the genius animators. I mean, like some of the best in the world. And they hired 150 Americans, I mean, and built a huge studio in Honolulu with supercomputers to do all this stuff. And uh, <laughs> and video games don't have narrative stories and don't particularly believe in character development. And it was <coughs> just, you know, a huge frustration, but a lot of fun, you Did know. Did you have to go to Japan? Yeah, but mostly I had to go to Honolulu. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> no problem there. You would actually spend some time in Japan as a young person. I did. That's part of why I got hired. I mean, like, I was comfortable with Japanese people and could speak just enough to get the job. Kambawa. I couldn't write a bit. <laughs> well, Stephen, have you uh, got a memory of a director that you enjoyed working with? Well, I, uh, I worked with Robert Altman on what was supposed to be his fine, well, or what was supposed to be his next film, turns out to be the, the, the film that, the, that he didn't get to make because he died several months before it went to it was supposed to go into production. And it was a wonderful experience. Uh, Altman was famous for being, you know, uh, horrible with screenwriters, or, or not horrible with them, but, but for, for not respecting the sacred text of a screenplay. <laughs> and uh, I went in with that knowledge and, uh, and I, the first time we met, you know, we started talking about the script and, and it, it was, a, uh, it was a, a movie called Hands on a Hard Body, which is based on the famous documentary mm -hmm. about the trying to uh, win a pickup truck and Meryl Streep and Billy Bob Thornton and Tommy Lee Jones and Jack Black. I mean, it was an incredible cast. And, and I, had, uh, I was hired to, to, to write a draft of it and I remember one of the first things Altman said to me was, you can write whatever you want, but you know I'm going to double cross you. <laughs> and I just <laughs> love that. Yeah. I just, I, I love the idea that all the cards were on the table. This was his movie. I was there to help him in whatever way I could. He, 
you know, he said to me several times, he was very, you know, he was, he was sick at that time and, and uh, you know, didn't, wasn't able to work more than f three or four hours a day. But, uh, I mean, he said to me several times, like, you know, you can't fail. None of us can <laughs> fail because we're here just to have fun and make a movie. And, and it, was, it was just a great experience. And uh, he was a, somebody you could, uh, you could really respect he did, but was not intimidating. You could you could sort of, you know, talk back to him when you needed to. And I just had had a great time. I loved all the people around him, and that was probably my best director experience so far. I worked with uh, Sidney Pollock on a movie that, that that never got made. I liked him a great deal too. I mean, a real gentleman, a really really. Often seems good. to have a fascination with Texas. He's worked with. Uh, Another Texas writer, well, Ann Rapp, Rapp, a couple yeah. of times, and, uh, and, and Ann had done a previous draft of this movie, uh -huh. and uh, no, uh, he and he, he of course wrote, you know, he made Doctor T and the Women, of Brewster course. McCloud, which mm -hmm. was set in the Astrodome. Mm -hmm. uh, he he likes Tex like Texas, and I think uh, he. Uh, I just think he liked making movies. I think that was, and he did it his own way. That was what was so fascinating. This is a guy who, you know, grew up, you know, sort of made his own way, started making industrial films, and and morphed into to episodic TV. But just, I don't think he'd ever been on anybody else's movie set. He just invented his own way of doing it. Oh. And I just really, as a craftsman, as a as a pioneer, I think he was just remarkable. It's a shame we, we aren't going to get to see Hands on Hard Body. Yeah, it's, 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 or maybe we'll see it, but you without might see Altman's it, touch. Yeah, right, which was a significant touch, yeah. as we know. Well, what about another kind of collaboration? Al, you have a lot of experience collaborating on screenplays with another writer. What about your experiences with Bill Broyles and on Apollo 13? Well, that was a relationship that went back a long ways. I mean, like, Bill had been, I mean, like, Steve is working with him now. I mean, like, we both worked with him as a magazine editor. So we knew it could work. I mean, like, in our situation, we'd known each other a long time. We'd worked together before and, and produced results that we both thought were worth doing, you know? So, mm -hmm. I mean, like, we went into it with some confidence which I think is important. I mean, like, it's tricky to collaborate, you know? I mean, like, you have to have two people who are, who are comfortable working together without getting their egos in the way, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, to where you're, like, you're really, truly trying to make it something better than either one of you would have done individually. I mean, like, when it works, that's when it, when it, and that's true of movies more broadly. I mean, like, everybody brings something to the process, and hopefully it turns into something that, that is bigger than the sum of its parts. I mean, like it's it, you know, that's that's when it's art and not just business. Well, that kind of brings me to another topic that we didn't talk about earlier, and that's the fact that both of you hail from journalism in your early days, and in some ways, the things you wrote about in that journalistic career informed a lot of what you did as screen have done and are doing as screenwriters. And uh, I'd love to hear, uh, you know, what's the connection, where's the thread? How does that happen? Is it just the luck of the draw? Somebody thinks you're an expert at it now and so you get the, the gig or is it a passion that you have for that subject matter that drives you? Well, nobody gives you a gig as a screenwriter. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I used to think that, that people, that, you know, that my phone would ring and somebody said, oh, I, I love your writing. I'd like to, make, <laughs> I'd like to pay you all this money. Did you so, get but but I, I will say for me, the uh, the absolute importance of, of journalism has, 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 has sort of defined my career as a, quote, creative writer, as a novelist, and as a screenwriter. It's because when I first started trying to write fiction, when I was, you know, in my early 20s, I didn't know anything. I didn't, I, all I knew was my own moods, you know. And when I started writing magazine pieces for Texas Monthly, for Bill Broyles, who, you know, our, our friend uh, and collaborator, I was thrust out into the world. I was, I was, uh, you know, given a notebook, and you know, told to go find a story and and write a story. And I learned not only about other people and other other situations that I hadn't encountered. I learned that a story was a containable thing. That that it had it had a shape. It had a had to have a beginning, middle, and end. It had to have character and color and texture. And, and those lessons, uh, you learn those when you're a magazine writer or a reporter. You learn those under 
such intense deadline pressure that there's no time, not much time for self-doubt. If, if you were trying to write a novel or even a screenplay, you, you, would, you could take forever because there's no, there, there's no absolute drop-dead deadline, but there was with magazine work. So you quickly learned how much to invest in the actual verbiage and how much, how, f how far that could get you, but how far you still had to go in terms of structure and organization. And th those lessons are, are just absolutely paramount in my experience. What about you, Al? What's well, I was a, a, a newspaper journalist before I was a magazine journalist. And, and it taught me basically those same lessons. I mean, like, but, I mean, because you do learn how to have, how, how to tell a story. I mean, you have to organize the information and you have to find the narrative line. I mean, and, and that's true no matter what form you're writing in. But more importantly is, it is for me at least, I mean, like it taught me that I enjoy the process of writing. You know, I mean, like by the time I I started to attempt screenwriting, I'd been a writer for several years, you know, many years, and I enjoyed it. You know, I mean, like it, it was something that I thought I was reasonably good at, and and it never seemed to get easier. But I I still enjoyed doing it, and I think for me that was it is that was more important than the lessons I learned. It's just that I had found out that I enjoyed doing this. You yep. had some uh, signature topics in the days of Texas Monthly that were, you know, all very compelling. Some of the hitmen and, um, you know, all kinds of unsavory guys. Well, well I I'd, 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 I'd had been a police reporter at the Houston Chronicle. I mean, there were like the, some of those kind of stories came naturally to me. Did um, you expect when the story of the Apollo astronauts came into your lap, or, or it, uh, maybe it didn't come that way? <laughs> well, it was a story that interested me. I mean, like I think you do good journalism when you when you because they're they're all hard work. You know, I mean, you've got to do a lot of research. You've got to, you know, find the gumption to go out and ask strangers, you know, personal questions. And uh, and I think it, you're not going to do that unless the particular story or subject, or you're going to do it better mm -hmm. when you're doing something that you're personally curious about. Perhaps learning how to ask the the strangers those questions is sort of a rehearsal for having to ask what characters might be doing in a screenplay later. Oh yeah. Stephen, well, I mean, right? you're cuz you're trying to, you know, present a character even in a, even in a little short newspaper story. You know, you go out and you meet, you know, John the farmer. And you're going to want to come back and try to present John the farmer to the newspaper audience or the magazine audience. I mean, and you're going to try to do your best to capture that person's character. You know, I mean, and put it down on paper. You well, so you're, well, you're, uh, I'm talking about <coughs> Apollo 13, Sorry. which Al wrote with Bill, and your material came, for that movie, came out of your work as a journalist. I mean, because Absolutely. you did this very memorable Texas Monthly story about, about Apollo astronauts, and, and, and I, I remember very clearly when I read that story and saw this wonderful illustration that, that this is a world-class piece of writing. And I wonder if you would have had thought to write Apollo 13 had you not had that experience of going out and getting that story. And it's the same in, true in my life. I mean, and it, it, it's, it's, you have this, as a journalist, you, we both had, I think, this backlog of possible stories and of information that we, and, and the, other, the, the more important, uh, an equally important thing is we know how to research. So, you know, you, you take a screenwriter who just starts out as a screenwriter has never done anything else, and they're supposed to write a story, a, a movie about, I, I don't know, say the Civil War. They may not have the, the understanding, you know, of how to go get that information in the same way somebody who's had the experience of, of, right. of, of, of real serious research on a, on a magazine story has. Had you ever heard of Ishii when you... Yeah, I had, yeah. And uh, <coughs> that was a, a, a famous, a famous story. Ishi was the last quote wild Indian in America. A uh, you know a Yahi member of the Yahi tribe who uh, was captured in 1911 stealing meat from a slaughterhouse and and uh, 
uh, it was ended up being a janitor in the San Francisco Museum of Anthropology. It's a famous story. But when I was approached about uh, making it into a movie, uh, I I didn't know all the particulars of it. But again, I I, I knew how to go, go out and find the information, and uh, that's thrilling. I mean, I, I, it's still thrilling for me to to be given a task, you know, learn this. And you know, sometimes the learning curve is very steep. Uh, sometimes it's already kind of within the range of what you've already uh, established as, as as your territory. But it's all it's just, and that was one of the great the great bonuses of writing <laughs> magazine pieces is who am I going to be this month? What am I going to be doing? Who am I going to be talking to? And that's the, the that process of discovery. Uh, is, is, is very much in play in, in writing screenplays as well. I think it's very much in play in any kind of, I mean, like, curiosity is, is, is a central attribute, I think, to journalism. I mean, like, you have to genuinely be curious about what's going on over there, what are they doing, or how is that happening, or, you know, to where the, you really want to go out and learn all this stuff, you know, I mean, and then tell it to other people because you're a fundamentally curious person to where I think that you have to have that sort of that brand of craziness to, to d be successful in journalism. And maybe in a lot of other, you know, because it is, it translates totally into screenwriting. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a minute about how you get your ideas when it's not coming from journalism. Uh, just in general, if you have a topic already, but you are now trying to come up with the the structure, the ideas for what happens in this movie. What do people say? Wh what sort of uh, stimuli do you use other than illegal drugs <laughs> or whatever <laughs> that, that will help you? Uh, in terms of, of, of writing own, it or discovering, the, uh, discovering in, something in to write In that research and in that uh, imaginative mode that when you're, before you are, it just starts spinning out of you. Well, for me, I, I talked a little bit this, about this earlier. If you've got an idea for a movie, what I do is take all the pressure off myself because it, nothing frightens me more than, than having to write. And when I'm telling myself I'm not writing, I'm just kind of noodling around, I, my mind is a lot freer. I, I, I feel less threatened <laughs> by the task. And so what I do is if, it's a, if I've got a, a subject vaguely, uh, you know, I just start asking myself the question, what is the most intense, uh, charged moments in this story? I, you know, they may end up in the movie, they may not, but I just start writing, writing them down in no particular order. You know, uh, they break up here, he kills her there, she gets revenge here, <laughs> you know, and just start, you know, what are the, the high points? And just, it's, it, that, those notes tend to evolve into an outline. And once you have an outline, uh, you're home. I mean, because as Al knows very well, it's writing a screenplay is all about structure. I mean, it's about how this scene propels the story forward. And so the scenes that propel the story forwards are scenes where people are in conflict, where one character has to, has to choose, uh, make, it, make a, a, a profound decision that will affect his or her life from then on. And so you look for those moments. When you've got enough of them, pretty much you've got a story. When you approached Ishii, the issue in that movie is, is whether or not, I can't remember the name of the, the, sure the professor, <laughs> but Kroger, the professor, Alfred Kroger. you know, could not uh, face death. And Ishii was facing the death of his entire race, mm -hmm. essentially. How did, that, that wasn't a, a, a theme necessarily that just emerged from the, the, the history that we knew. Mm -hmm. Yet you took that theme and, and made a very touching and moving piece yeah. about it. Uh, at what point did, you, when you were looking at Ishii's uh, background and the historical facts, did you suddenly go, this is a, a profound thematic? Well, uh, there were probably, I mean, it's a long time ago, but I'm trying to remember, there were probably two moments. One is, I was trying to figure out what the story was because it's a familiar story and I wanted to make it very personal to the, to, in terms of the characters. And the story is told by, it has been most widely known because it's been told by Alfred Kroeber's second wife. 
and she wrote a book called Ishii in Two Worlds, which is a classic. But what I discovered in reading a couple other books that are less well known was that Krober, the, the professor of anthropology, who sort of sponsored Ishii into the world, into our, our world, had a first wife who died of tuberculosis. And there was this, this very faint reference in one of these books to uh, Professor Krober's wife died, and after he died, he took a walk on the beach. And I thought, that's a scene. That and that, what does that, and he never, you never heard, hear, heard about Henriette or Henrietta, even her name was kind of uh, not, not exact. What, what happened to her? Why, why did he never speak of her? The, the other person he never spoke of, the no other person he never wrote about was Ishii, who was by some measures the most important person in his <coughs> life. So there was this silence f from this guy about these two extremely pivotal characters in his life, and that there, there's silence. Yeah, <laughs> there must be conflict. yeah, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that sort of was, got me started into finding a way to, to tell the story. Yeah. Characters so important, Al. When you were uh, getting the idea to make for all mankind, you had this journalism that you do wonderful stories you'd done about the Apollo astronauts. When you first started talking to them in terms of making for all mankind. Did you know that it was going to be just about some guys who took a trip to the moon, which is sort of that wonderful way you used to pitch the movie? <laughs> I loved it. Well, that's such a, you know, an idiosyncratic movie. I'm not sure that, that I mean, I, I agree with the character stuff. I mean, but okay, I mean, on, on For All Mankind, it was just, that grew out of a totally visual idea. I mean, like when I was doing the Texas Monthly story that, that, that uh, <coughs> Steve was talking about so generously, um, while I was down at NASA, I mean, I realized that they had this unbelievable archive of, of film footage. I mean, like that I had never seen most of and I didn't think most other people had either. And we had certainly never seen it on a big screen, which I thought is what it needed and deserved to be realistic. I mean, like we're we got cameras on at other planets. I mean, we're watching it on a TV screen. How ridiculous is that? And so the whole impetus of that whole project was really an effort to kind of just showcase those pictures. You know, I mean, and 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 the 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 organization and the structure of of the story grew out of that. I mean, like you start, you you know, you put on your helmet and you go out to the launch pad and you ride up the elevator and you blast off and, you know, here's step one and step two and step three. I mean, it's a very organized process getting to the moon. So I had the whole, you know, I mean, they wrote the story for me. I mean, like <laughs> it was really just a, trying to figure out a way to, to, to find the best visuals. I mean, and, and, and make the best use of them and at the same time I was interviewing all these guys and they were saying things that I found moving and, and I wanted to try to fit them in there too. I mean to where it, it, it was it's like found art mm -hmm. you know I mean like I found these pictures and I found these these you know voices these interviews and it was just trying to jam it all the good stuff in. So then you had to make a leap to pure drama and based upon the one really disastrous kind of moment, I guess, in Apollo's program. Well, Apollo 13 for me, I mean, was such a piece of cake. I mean, to where like, we, you know, the, the real world gave us this amazing story and, uh, mm -hmm. and our job was to just try to, you know, I mean, like put it together in, 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 a, in a movie package, you know, which, which I, I mean, like it's still the easiest thing I ever did. and. Uh, and it was great fun, and it had a lucky star over it, you know? I mean, because, like, I guarantee you, I mean, like, the Hollywood people never thought they were going to make that movie in a million years. Why? Because bo astronauts were boring. It happened 30 <laughs> years ago. I mean, like, I remember when we turned in our first draft. This was right about Thanksgiving of whatever year it was. And Ron Howard was just finishing the previous movie he had made, which was called The Paper. It was about a newspaper. He was just finishing that, and he was supposed to pick his next project for next year from a list they had on this board. And he was supposed to pick one of the top five, which had been under development for years, and the studio had invested all this money in, and we weren't even one of those five. I mean, like, we were down here in the dust. <laughs> 
because nobody thought they were ever going to make this movie. I mean, to where, like, we got paid nothing. I mean, basically, guild minimum to do it, you know. I mean, which meant that the studio never read it, never cared about it, you know. I mean, we never got studio notes. The only people we ever had to talk to were, like, Ron Howard and his, 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 uh, d his development guy who talked him into buying it because he grew up in Clear Lake. Um, <laughs> named Michael Bostick. I mean, to where, like, we never had the whole studio thing happen until after Howard finally decided, this is the movie I want to make. And he got Tom Hanks to agree to, 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 Hanks really wanted to do it, and Hanks wasn't the first choice. You know, so, I mean, and the studio had, had had nothing to do with it. I mean, as soon as the studio got involved, they had a bunch of terrible ideas and fired us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, so it's just crazy. I mean, like, but the truth of the matter is, it, is it was a great real life story that, and as far as I'm concerned, I mean, the best thing about it is he had this killer ending. You know, I mean, like, <laughs> the, how are you going to screw that up? So well, you brought up something inter interesting. You, we see uh, um, posters for films. We see many writers listed sometimes. And you obviously get the credit for having written this, but other writers came aboard after, we're, after you were so-called fired. And if, explain to our students how that works in Hollywood. Uh, Nobody <laughs> can explain Hollywood that. knives. It's a crazy <coughs> process that doesn't make any sense. I mean, like, but I have learned a lot about it because ultimately the decision of who gets the credit is controlled by the Writers Guild. You know, I mean, like, no matter how many writers the studio hires, and no matter who they think, which usually has a lot to do with how much they paid them, <laughs> you know, determines who they think was the most important. Ultimately, I mean, before a film or a show is released, the Writers Guild is going to arbitrate between these people. And since I've been living in Los Angeles, I mean, like, that's been my primary involvement with my union, the Writers Guild, is like I am on the arbitration committee and have done a lot of arbitrations, which means that you read every single draft by every single writer, even if it goes back three or four or five years. I mean, like I did an arbitration on a big movie that's been in development for six or eight years, had 15 writers on it who wrote 20 some drafts. And I really read every single one of those drafts carefully, or some, not all of them, you know, I mean, but the truth of the matter is, is myself and two other writers had the responsibility of deciding who got the credit for that. And as long as other writers are making the decision, I think it's a fair process. I mean, that doesn't mean that people don't bitch. I mean, like they do. I've been on the wrong side of it. I've won arbitrations and lost arbitrations. But, but as long as writers are in charge of making that decision, and I think most writers would tell you this, I mean, like, there's not a better way to do it. I, I remember, I, I agree with you. I have written, I, I remember one movie I, where I wrote every single line of dialogue and wrote the entire, you know, structured the entire movie and didn't get any credit. And, uh, so you had lousy arbitrators. I had lousy arbitrators, but I, there's no better. It's like democracy. It's, it, there's nothing. It's the worst form of government there is, but there's nothing better. And and the way that that you know, I think Gal's right. Writers are because the because the studios are often so profligate with 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 writers. I mean, you know, putting ten or twelve writers on a, on a project during the course of its life. There's got to be some some way to figure out some sort of fair uh, adjudication of it. And, and, and the Writers Guild has, I think, wisely, and in the case of that movie I wrote but didn't write, the, <laughs> the, the first writer got credit because she had originated the basic concept, mm -hmm. and that's where it's weighted. And the reason this is so important besides ego is because when you make a deal with a, for a movie, you, you get a fee for writing it, Plus, you get a bonus, and that bonus, if it gets made, and that bonus can be, you know, pretty big. And if a ri another writer shares credit with you, they get half your bonus. So, so it's a very territorial mm -hmm. 
deal that goes on, and it's it's screwy. Oh, and on a big movie, that's a lot of money. It's a ton of money, yeah. I mean, like, I was an arbitrator on a movie just this past summer. I mean, like, it was the most expensive movie made last year. And the, the writers, I mean, like, we did our arbitration thing, and, the, and it, all these three different teams of writers all hired lawyers. You know, I mean, like, they wanted to take it to court. I mean, these were high-powered, expensive Hollywood lawyers, you know? I mean, like, filing this injunction, that blah, blah. You know, I mean, and ultimately the courts decided that they didn't want to have anything to do with it mm -hmm. because the, the, <laughs> the Writers Guild has historically been in charge of, of making these judgments. Oh. Difficult business, difficult business. I, mean, I won't even launch into the Writers Guild and the recent strike and the one before that and the, probably the ones to come, but I want to kind of wind it up here. We've kind of gone through creative. We've gone from business to creative to business again, but uh, let's open up uh, the discussion to our student audience. We have uh, actually a mixed uh, uh, audience here tonight of members of faculty and students, and we'd like to take questions from the audience and uh, let Al and Stephen answer those questions if they have them. Well, you, uh, you sit on a, a policy team, you know, with, with, the, with the movement at, at such a grand uh, scale. We're going to cut from here. Oh. <laughs> 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 well, if you sort of see this way, then why don't you stand, okay. you know, just stand right here? And, but and don't worry about the camera. Just okay. Just All right. Great. We can just close it out for you. Excellent. Right. Okay. And tell me your name again. Nick. Nick. Okay. Yeah, so my uh, question is, you're talking about Apollo uh, 13, you know, uh, writing that script and, and everything, and, and you mentioned you were at the, uh, the center viewing, you know, these images and what have you. Uh, uh, my question you know, for that is, you know, you said that story just came right to you, right? But uh, there's got to be other things you have to apply into the story, such as, like, the drama, the conflict, the, lo the, the love interest, and there's so many, you know, elements and, and variables involved in that. So what... Uh, what is it that you that you did or, or, or your process to, to actually say, hey, I got these great pictures, but I'm going to put all this emotion into it as well. So how does that be fused together? Well, again, I don't think Apollo 13 is a very good example for, for learning to be a screenwriter. I mean, because the truth of the matter is the critical stuff in that movie came from real life. I mean, it had more drama. We had to leave out stuff. You know, I mean, like, it was, it was a great real-life story that we, you know, organized and shaped and, and like that. But uh, the truth of the matter is we wanted to be as honest as we could be to the real story. We didn't think we were smart enough to improve on the real story to where our job was to just fit it into a movie. You know, so I mean, like it had the right turn at the end of Act One. I mean, and at the end, you know, it, in between the second and third acts, where we're, we're trying to give it a movie structure, but the story itself was just a great real-life human drama. I mean, we were really blessed with having that story to work with. I mean, and 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 we tried not to make up too much stuff. The studio came up with ideas like, well, why don't we have a girlfriend in common between this astronaut and this mission controller, <laughs> you know? I mean, stuff like that. We had those ideas pushed on us that we tried to resist, but of course didn't really have the, as writers, we didn't have the authority to, to stand up to them. I mean, like fortunately we had a director and a star that also wanted to honor the real story, and they said, kiss off. You know, I mean, and they could get away with it. But that's a case of, of real life being so good you don't want to mess it up. Hi. Um, in the beginning of your building of your career uh, as, uh, you know, uh, screenwriters and, uh, you know, screenplay writers for the movies, what were the biggest factors that you found that helped pave your way and open the doors for the many opportunities that you've had thereof? Well, we were talking earlier about our, our background in journalism, and, and for me, uh, both in a kind of substantive way in terms of the material and in a strategic way in terms of the contacts, it was, it, it was the fact that I was uh, a staff writer at Texas Monthly, 
Texas Monthly had an, an agency that represented them in case any of the uh, uh, any of the stories that were, were published in the magazine turned out to be movie material. And so uh, Larry Wright and I, who was also a staff member at the time, we, we decided we were going to write a screenplay, having never seen one. And we both had two weeks off, and we just wrote one. <laughs> and, and we gave it to this agent who represented Texas Monthly, and she sent it to Sidney Pollack, who bought it. And uh, so without that contact, w but, but without the contact that w with the magazine, we wouldn't have had the contact with the agent, we didn't, and probably nothing would have ever happened with that script. So it's, I guess the lesson there is you, you need to take advantage of, of where you are and who you happen to know in that position that, that you're in and just try to, to get to know people who might have the, uh, the ability or the, or the connections to get, get your script to where it needs to be. How do you know when a script is done and it's ready to let it go find its own path? That's a good question from this young lady. <laughs> well, the, unfortunately, scripts are never done. I mean, and, and movies aren't ever really done either, but scripts in particular. I mean, we're like, I've done projects where I've done umpteen drafts. I mean, like, I've got one now that I've been, that's a script of my own, it's a spec script that I bet I've got 15 drafts of, you know. And I like to think that they got better, you know. I mean, like, I hate to think that they get worse, I mean, but <laughs> you're always coming up with stuff. I mean, like, uh, you know, I mean, like, it's finished when somebody else says we're going to shoot that. And the truth is they're not. They're going to change it anyway. <laughs> but I guess the question is also, when do you send it out? When do you, when, and I, I don't know if there's an easy answer to that. It's <laughs> when you're either sick of it or proud <laughs> of it. You, know? uh, you just have this sort of internal feeling that it's ready, that you've done about as much to it as you can do. And, but then, you know, with the stipulation that, that when, you, when you've reached that point where you feel like you've done as much to it as you can do, I'll guarantee you, you'll rewrite 90% of it <laughs> by the time it actually makes it to a movie screen. I mean, well, there's what, I mean, and I've never really had this opportunity, but I mean, like, there's something that, that's really magical that happens when you see an actor actually saying the lines that you put on paper. And there are so, and particularly if, if it's a good actor, I mean, because like I remember the first time this ever happened to me, I'm watching Tom Hanks say a line that I wrote. I remembered writing it. And he said that line about six different ways that could have been interpreted completely different ways that I had never thought of. You know, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a magical process. And somebody can say a line in a, in a run through or something that, that you can realize. That's what the movie's about. <laughs> That's what I should have written the movie. About, you know, because just, just the inflection of, the, of, the, of an actor delivering a line can, 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 can just create whole worlds for you. And, and at the same time, it can shrink whole worlds too. Because, <laughs> yeah. because you know, you, you, sometimes, they, sometimes in your mind, the whole movie hinges on the power of this one line. And an actor will just run right over it and not even stop to, 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 to consider the, import, the importance that you had thought it had. And so you're dealing with two different sets of instincts. Yours is a writer and an actor who, uh, who's maybe looking for something different in a scene than you, than you are. Have you, either of you, tried having readings at an early stage to, to see what you can garner from that? I've done it once, and it, I didn't garner much from it, except I think, I think readings of scripts are pretty tedious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's why they invented movies, so we wouldn't have, <laughs> wouldn't have to read the scripts. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's interesting, but uh, it, unless it's for real somehow, unless you're, you're with the real cast and the real director, it's a, it feels to me like a kind of rhetorical exercise. I mean, it takes too much to organize it. I've never tried it. But what I do, so, you know, I mean, like I find myself saying my own lines out loud, you know, mm -hmm. because like oftentimes it will sound different in the air than it did on the, my computer, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll learn something from that. I have one more question. Um, sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on my own uh, <laughs> screenplay, so I'm, I'm riddled with questions. So uh, um, 
as far as dialogue goes, now you, you can compare. Uh, we, we talked about earlier uh, Pulp Fiction, right? Where uh, you know Tarantino just you know spills out you know maybe a paragraph of dialogue, but then you know if if you if, if you stick to structure, as you mentioned before, um, you want to keep dialogue to a minimum. A as writers, do you guys favor either or, or, or is, is is it a blend or or a I hope my question makes sense. No, it makes sense. <laughs> I, I think it. I think it's a, it is a blend, but I think uh, you're well advised, both in a kind of uh, real world way in terms of getting the script read, and in terms of an, uh, the aesthetic of the script to keep the dialogue pared back as much as you can, because it is a visual medium. It's a profoundly visual medium, and you can work. You know, I've been writing screenplays for, for like 25 years, and I still don't. I'm still astonished at how little my writing matters <laughs> and, and, and how, how much the things that, that are out of my control matter. You know, they, the, 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 just the, the look and feel of the movie and, and of course the structure of it. And uh, so I think, you know, Quentin Tarantino, the, there's a key difference, Quentin Tarantino directed, directs his That movie. makes a huge yeah. difference. And, yeah, and so you can create an, uh, a field of, of, of reality for yourself as a director that you can't as a writer. You have to get, the, the screenplay has to work on the terms and on which a screenplay works. Uh, if you're a director and if you've got the money in hand to, or the backing to make the, the movie, then you can play in a way that you can't quite do as a screenplay. I mean, the Coen brothers are another good example of somebody that can get away with dialogue that I don't think a screenwriter could. You know, I mean, like, they have, they go on digressions, I mean, like, in Coen Brothers movies that have nothing to do with telling the story. It doesn't really advance the story. It just gives you a little insight into this character. And most Hollywood movies, that, that scene would have been cut. They never would have shot it, you know. dialogue speeches and so you and you want an actor to read it but be sure you have that moment somewhere in that screenplay where the actor stops reading and sets it down and starts rehearsing their Academy Award winning acceptance <laughs> speech because if that's not in there don't give it to the actor to read yet you know My question is pretty much along the same lines of opportunity. You can write anywhere and we're all pretty much aware of that, but are there important places that you should be so you can get those first time opportunities like California or New York or is it okay to just stay in Texas and write and try to send it out to everybody? I think it's it's okay to stay in Texas. I mean, that's <laughs> what that's what I did. Spoken by an Austinite. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, I don't w was that the smartest decision I ever made? Uh, I don't know, but I think it's a defensible position. <laughs> um, I mean, and, and particularly more and more defensible as Austin becomes more and more the center of the universe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's important. I, I, I'm, I'm perverse this way. I mean, I write books and I write movies. I've never lived in New York or never lived in Los Angeles. And I think that's probably a strategic mistake. But I, I think that it's just it's just you. It's like what you want to do, and and you 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 create your own reality, and you, and you you organize the world around that. I think if it's if it's all the same to you to move to Los Angeles to write movies, why not do that? Because that's where that's where the action is. That's where the contacts, you know, the the number of contacts you would make are are vastly more than even in Austin. But at the same time, if it's if it doesn't nurture you in some essential way. Uh, to be in Los Angeles, uh, in, uh, you're better off being in Austin. And so, in my case, I had three children by the time I had ever written a movie. I had a whole family. I didn't want to move to LA, and I just—it was just more important to me to to stay here and and write and 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 try to get into the business and stay in the business that way. 
Would you like to talk about your decision to leave? Which we well, still it's like any big decision in your life. There's so many factors, you know, that come into play. I mean, like that. It's not strictly a business decision. I mean, I know it certainly wasn't in my case. Um, ultimately, I think you should live in a place where you do your best work, where you feel most comfortable. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm not even advocating that I'm doing that, you know, but I think that that's what's best for you. I mean, like, you, you want to be where you do your best work because that's ultimately going to determine how successful you are. Oh, yes. So you're saying that you worked on the board as an arbitrator. As do they normally try to give the screenwriter who originated their work credit, or does it often go to other people? and not that writer? Well, it tends to be weighted towards the first writer, the original writer, particularly in an original script. I mean, like if somebody came up with the idea for a movie, they sort of get extra points because it started with them. You know, even if somebody came in later and made pretty significant changes. There's actually a mathematical formula that's in the Writers Guild bylaws that I don't think anybody can really parse and figure out honestly, you know? I mean, like, a, if a lot of it is a judgment call. If you're adapting a book, that sort of credit for originality goes to whoever wrote the book. And then the, the writers that adapted that book are on a more kind of even basis than somebody who came up with an original idea for an original script. Uh, yeah, Stephen, you did an adaptation of The Old Man and the Sea. Uh, how intimidating is it to work with the words of a master and to, to uh, adapt one of the true classics of our literature, and especially when it's kind of thought of as a minimalist jewel and you're actually expanding on that material, creating new material? How, how intimidating is that, and how did you go about doing that? Well, it's interesting. The Old Man and the Sea is a, it's a Nobel Prize. About not Nobel, but Hemingway wrote the Nobel Prize basically because he wrote that book or won the Nobel Prize, and it's a very you know, and Hemingway is is the most you know uh, powerful author of our time I think, and and it is a little intimidating when you think about taking this book and and trying to make a movie out of it, but my you know my response to myself was don't be intimidated. And I looked at the, uh, I looked at, I read this, the book yet again. It's very, as you say, very minimalist. Uh, there's only, you know, less than 200 pages, certainly. And it only, it only takes place over the course of a two or three days. And that begins, the almost first line is, it had been 87 days since the old man had caught a fish. And I realized if I accounted for the 87 days, I would have a, a, a real story uh, for, for, for a movie because the, the last act of the movie is going out for the la last time, catching the marlin, uh, you know, struggling with the marlin all by himself and finally losing it to the, to the sharks. And so I, had, I needed two acts to begin the movie. And, and I just looked for them in the hints that Hemingway had dropped in, in the story. His relationship with the boy, the Santiago, the old man's <coughs> relationship with the boy, uh, the fact that the boy had been not allowed by his parents to fish with Santiago anymore. I saw that as, wow, there's a great scene where his parents refuse to allow him to fish with the old man anymore. I mean, and, and there's a, they talk about, there, there's one m moment where Hemingway talks about how uh, he had removed his late wife's picture from the wall and put it under his mattress. And I thought, what if we account for the moment where his wife dies? So I begin the movie, uh, he's come, he and the boy are fishing together, coming in uh, and on from a day's fishing on the shore, there's the priest standing with a group of sullen villagers or, or you know, very somber looking villagers to give him the news that his wife has died. Hmm. So the idea formed in my mind repeatedly that this man is somebody who's been stripped of everything. His wife, his fishing, mojo and and the the help and love of this boy that means everything to him and so where we find him when he goes out where Hemingway began the book where he goes out to to to, to fish 
for this great Marlin is the moment at, at which he's absolutely the most vulnerable he's ever been in his life. And that, to me, made dramatic sense as a story. And, and it was all just sort of following the crumbs that Hemingway had left. I but can't wait to see it. <laughs> well, it's it's F. Murray Abraham is the old man. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh -huh. oh. El Paso's huh. own F. Murray Abraham. You know he's from El Paso? That's from El Paso. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good for him. Who's making it? Uh, it's Robert Holmey, who's uh, oh, man, did, yeah, you know, did Lonesome Dove and you know, any number of Is things. it shooting already? Not yet, no. Okay. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. Okay. Well, listen, I think we've come to the end of our show. And I want to thank all of you students and faculty for being here and asking great questions. And uh, I want us all to thank our wonderful screenwriters for coming, Al coming all the way back to Austin to see us. And Stephen coming all oh, the way from to Central to Austin. Austin. <laughs> 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 Thank Thanks, you so Eddie. much. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much from the Departments of Creative Writing and Radio, Television, and Film for joining us this evening. <laughs>